Good morning, everybody, and many thanks for inviting me to speak here to you today. It's a great honor and a privilege also. And thank you also for the hospitality that you have already shown to me and to my wife. She's following me here. For once, I have her listening to me because normally at home I listen to her. <laughs> so, I have never been to Australia before, but especially the research by Ahuri has been a constant inspiration in my own work for a long time. As you know, I come from a far away northern country where we now have the late summer, and normally the temperature is about the same as you have now here. <laughs> but this summer has been exceptional, so when we left at home, it was 30 degrees Celsius. So, but the Finnish winter, as you know, is something quite else. I'm going to speak about ending homelessness, and I hope that my talk will give you another best perspective on homelessness, so that inviting me here has been worth it. And please remember that I am only a spokesperson for all those people dedicated to end homelessness in Finland. So when I say we, I really mean we, all the people working with homelessness in Finland. It's not a cliche, it has a real meaning. My main message is that <coughs> homelessness should and can be ended. It's not an utopian ideology. It's a completely reasonable, realistic goal that is ethically and also economically viable. I will tell you what we have done in Finland to reach that goal, a little about housing first, and also about what we should do next. But first we need some background and a little bit of history. This is for the sake of comparison. I moved Finland closer to Australia, so you can <laughs> notice the difference. The land area of the country is a little bit bigger than the state of Victoria. The population is a little bit smaller, and especially our capital city, the beautiful city of Helsinki, is uh, rather small compared to Melbourne. Uh, we have had some hard times in our history. After the Second World War, in the peace treaty, Finland lost the area of Karelia to Soviet Union, and some 420,000 Finnish refugees about 10% of the total population were removed to Finland, where they were rehoused permanently in a few years. And this happened in a country which economy was in ruins after the war. Of course, it required some exceptional measures, forced legislation to take land from big landowners, for example, but still, compared to whatever homelessness we have, should be a piece of cake to deal with. Another feature related to homelessness also stems from these years after the Second World War. There was a serious lack of housing, especially in Helsinki, and many single, single soldiers returned from the front and ended up living in shelters that were operated in bomb shelters. Imagine the irony for soldiers ending up in peacetime living in bomb shelters. All of them had lost their youth, in war, many also their sanity or become traumatized, and quite many also addicted to a drug called pervitin that was used in the front lines. The last shelter operated underground was closed in 1954, actually the year when I was born. And this is really the beginning of modern Finnish homelessness, the hardcore of it, homelessness that was later called long-term homelessness. In the 60s, public awareness on homelessness was raised when several rough sleep, sleeping people died in cold weather. Some important NGOs started advocating the cause of homelessness, and in 67, the city of Helsinki opened a big night shelter called Bat Cave, or Flame Hotel, named after the spirit that uh, most of the single men were using. This was an iconic place which also stigmatized the public image of homelessness for a very long time. Ten years later, it was closed. City had opened some new, better facilities, and a group of young people, mainly rock musicians, occupied the building, where they had a famous rock radio station for ten years. And when it was closed, they had a rave of 48 hours, and the last piece that they played was 
Louis Armstrong's What a Wonderful World. Later, an office building for Nokia was built on the site. A serious and goal-oriented work to reduce homelessness really started in the 80s. At that time, I started my working life first as a social worker in the homelessness services for the city of Helsinki. And then from 83 to 80, 89, I was in charge of operational services for, for homeless people in Helsinki. At that time, we had the understanding that there were three groups of homeless people, one third whose only problem was the lack of affordable rental flat, one third who would need temporary support in supported housing before moving to independent living, and one third who needed more intensive care and support and were more unlikely to end up living independently. So it was quite a perfect staircase model, perfect except that it didn't work too well. As was customary at that time, people moving from shelters and hostels to supported housing were supposed to, for example, to stop drinking and abstain while in supported housing. Finally, in their own independent housing flat, they were also, once again, allowed to do whatever. This was quite an unrealistic expectation. But still, some very important developments started in the 80s. Finland is a country of late urbanization, so there was a lot of internal movement to bigger cities. An, Im an important role in solving housing problems caused by this movement was state-subsidized affordable social housing. They were mainly new flats for, for families, so the lack of small affordable hats was still a big issue in solving homelessness, which was mainly a problem of single homeless people. Enter on stage a new player, My foundation was founded in 85 by the five biggest cities in Finland, Finnish Red Cross, Finnish Mental Health Association, Finnish Evangelical Church, Finnish Association of Municipalities, Finnish Trade Union of Construction Workers, and Finnish Construction Industry. The mission was to help solving homelessness by buying flats from the private market. And this is still one important part of what we do and I think that the Bird of Wife Foundation illustrates one crucial element of the Finnish way, which later proved to be critically important, a very wide partnership across the society. In the 90s, uh, in the 80s, it was estimated that we had around 20,000 homeless people. We have a very wide definition of homelessness, so it included people sleeping with friends and relatives. A yearly count on homelessness was started and the first national programs were established. And they were mainly concentrating on providing more housing. Uh, and one could argue that the decrease in homelessness up till 2007 was mainly due to building especially new social ho housing and buying more flats from the private market. This table shows the general trend of homelessness and, and the flats that we have been buying from the private market since 1885. So you can see that there's still a gap, but we try to fill it. In the beginning of this century, there were concerns that the positive development had stopped and there was a growing risk of homelessness increasing also in Finland. At that time, I was asked to evaluate the previous programs and the main conclusion of the evaluation was where that we had been successful in alleviating the easy part of homelessness. What was left was the hard code of homelessness, long-term homeless people with multiple social and health issues, living in shelters and hostels and some even sleeping rough. So what was needed was a national program to provide permanent housing solutions for long-term homeless people. In 2007, our housing minister, who was one from a moderate conservative party, set up a working group of four, four wise, which included the Bishop of Helsinki, the director of Helsinki Social Services, my predecessor in Y Foundation, and a well-known civil activist, a psychiatric. I was working as a secretary, secretary in that group, and after three meetings, we had a paper called Name on the Door, which outlined the principles for future national program and policy. 
Then another working group made a more detailed plan, including financing, because I think that a plan without financing is not a plan, it is a wish list. Two meetings, and then our government made a decision of principle after which Ministry of Environment, which was in charge of co coordinating this program, ne negotiated with cities of the implementation. For each city, a letter of intent between city and cities and state authorities, including several ministries, were undersigned, and plans of implementation, including individual projects and financing for the program period, first four years and then four more, were approved in local councils. Overall, the program was a very broad partnership between state authorities, then later 11 cities and several NGOs, both on national and local level. The national program to end long-term homelessness started in 2008 and I worked as a program leader for five years. At the same time, one of the worst economic recessions after the Second World War hit Finland. In spite of that, all partners in this program fulfilled their financial commitments. So we had a very pragmatic program with an ambitious aim to hal half long-term homelessness in four years and then end it in eight years. We didn't make any new legislation. Actually, we looked at our legislation and realized that there was nothing in it that would prevent us from ending homelessness. To, fu to fulfill this goal, we had very clear quantitative targets 2,500 new dwellings. We wanted permanent housing solutions, and for that reason, the conversion of shelters and hostels into supported housing units. And a major paradigmatic change in the way we think about solving homelessness by introducing housing first, as we understand it, as a default principle for homelessness services. Our definition of long-term homelessness was a person who has severe social and health problems and who has been homeless over one year or recurrently homeless during the last two years. So what have we done? In eight years, we provided over 3,500 new dwellings for long-term homeless people. We have introduced new kind of support, employed over 300 new support workers, scaled up housing, advice services to prevent evictions, implemented and introduced our housing first principles and renovated and converted most of the hostels and shelters into supported housing units. So to finish housing first, this is the key principle that was established in the name on the door report, which says that uh, solving social and health problems is not something that you need to do. You don't have to be housing ready. Housing is the foundation for solving your problems. Uh, as a faraway northern country, we were not aware of housing first in, in New York. We were very happy when we named our principles housing first. It was only afterwards when Google revealed the truth to us. <laughs> Housing First already existed. Uh, this has caused some confusion. One of the latest examples was an American journalist who asked me, uh, could this Housing First policy be implemented in the USA? So I had on the tip of my tongue to say to him that you could try the American Housing First first. I have very great respect for Sam Semperis, who is really the father of Housing First. And actually, we work together also because he's one of the advisors in the Housing First Europe Hub, which we have established with FEANS, which includes 19 partners in 11 countries. We try to scale up, for example, training for, for Housing First in, in, in Europe. But to be clear, we have not been implementing the Pathways Housing First model in Finland. There are a lot of similarities, especially in the basic philosophy, but also some noteworthy differences. 
the main principles we try to be faithful can be found in the Housing First Europe guide, which is online, and which was published by Feanza. And as it happens, the author of that guide, Nicholas Please, is speaking here today also. So for us, Housing First means housing is a basic human right. It's unconditional housing in normal surroundings, in independent rental flats, with a rental contract of your own, normally a permanent con contract. Because I think that if you say that housing is unconditional, so if you have a temporary rental contract, that's also a condition already. Housing can be in scattered housing or in supported housing units. And support is available if you want it and, and, and need it. For us, the principle of normality, by which I mean things that are customary in our society, is very important. An ex-homeless person, when he gets a rental flat of his own, it means he has the same rights and obligations as everybody else. So he's supposed, for example, to pay the rent himself. If he doesn't have any income, he's eligible for general housing benefit and also for supplementary social welfare benefit, as everybody else. But he is the legal person who has to take care of the rent. Our model of support can be maybe best described by calling it intensive case management. We don't normally have an ACT team as we think that once again, according to normality principle, ex-homeless people can use the same basic social and healthcare services as everybody else. If there is a need for a more intensive ad hoc support team, it is for the support worker to arrange it. Uh, when we started the program, we had the idea of ratio of support personnel in scattered housing 1 to 10 and in supported housing units up to uh, 5 to 10, which is already the level of service housing, for example, in elderly care in Finland. Uh, it is difficult to say what is the adequate level of support because support needs vary. But the main thing, I think, is the availability and the flexibility of the support. We very much like to speak about complex needs, but in my opinion, we don't always need a very complex machinery to, to meet these needs. Uh, we have actually published a book in English I have one copy with me, but you can download it from, the, from our website in, in English. So it has a lot of practical information. It's a very pragmatic book, and there are so many things that I can't, within the limited time, to tell you about it. But here are some examples of support, what they can be. In supported housing, there are a lot of different forms of community work, especially the uh, Helsinki Diakonis Institute has been specializing in this, and also a lot of, lot of low threshold work or day, daily activities. And what has been remarkable is the, is the role of the Salvation Army in Finland, which, which has been a forerunner in developing low threshold work activities for, for the tenants. And the change in the operations of the Salvation Army in Finland, it has been quite exceptional in, in many respects. Uh, in scattered housing, there are also different forms. They are mainly, mainly the main principle is this intensive case management, but there are also some projects where, where you have, for, for example, detoxification at home or, or tailored harm reduction support for people with drug addiction. And floating support team for people with, with re recurrent psychosis, that's a very, very, excellent example in, in, in Helsinki. But there's a very simple way to describe how, how the paradigmatic change happened. Heli Alkila, who is the chief of uh, housing services for the Helsinki Diakonis Institute, once told me that when we were introducing Housing First, she was explaining the principles to her co-workers. And some of, some of them were very scared and shouted that, 
but it means that we are not getting rid of our tenants. There's no way we can get rid of the tenants. And Heli told, told her co-workers that this is exactly the idea of this new system. We are not getting rid of our tenants, as was customary in the hostel and shelter system. I think that this is my very personal opinion that a lot of discussion on housing first, especially about fidelity, is a, is a quite a kind of waste, waste of time. I have never heard a, an ex-homeless person complaining that the support he got was not provided by a full professional ACT team. What homeless people need, in my experience, is a safe permanent place with affordable rent, a flat you can call your own, and someone to rely on when you need help. Uh, speaking about support, our experience is that what's probably most problem problematic is the commissioning of support, support services. Basically, it's the local authorities, cities in Finland, who finance the support. And uh, support needs varying time and between individuals. The ar arrangements has to be very flexible, otherwise there is a risk of either over or under supply of support. I also think that the basic principles of Housing First are quite stable, but I see Housing First as a developing concept. So we have to develop the practical housing and support solutions in our own environment. The role of supported housing units, which have replaced hostels and shelters, has been very crucial in our program. They have provided permanent housing in independent rental apartments at, at the same time a possibility to a more intensive support as there are on-site personnel. Some researchers have criticized this model and said that it, is, it has institutional elements. Uh, well, our experience is that you need to have housing alternatives. For many, scattered housing is a preference and is still our main housing option but there are also chronic homeless people who fear the risk of loneliness and isolation in scattered housing. And also a group of long-term homeless people have somatic diseases for which they need daily care, and that is more easy to arrange in supported housing units. This Weinla supported housing unit is quite an optimal, a perfect example of a supported housing unit. It was built by Y Foundation. We are the owner of the building. We lease it to the city of Espo, and the support is provided by Salvation Army with 11 co-workers. There are 33 apartments, individual apartments with, with their with own rental contracts. The rent for a studio apartment of 36 square meters is around 470 euros. And there's also a small service fee based on the income that's decided based on the incomes of the tenants, which maximum is 74 euros. So why we wanted to get rid of shelters and hostels? For the simple reason that people living in shelters and hostels are still homeless. It is a temporary solution. It doesn't provide privacy and sufficient support. It is an easy solution, and it keeps, the, keeps up the system of two-level housing market for the homeless people. It creates a kind of subculture of homelessness, a culture of silence. We also know that homeless people have a much higher both mortality and mobility, death risk than average population. But it seems also that living in a shelter is a risk in itself. In a very recent article, a well-known Danish researcher, Lars Benjaminsen, found out that 80% of excess morbidity is explained by substance abuse problems and lack of employment, whilst, whilst mental illness, low income, low education, civil status, and ethnic minority background explain only a limited part. And still there is 20% of shelter users whose excess morbidity was not explained by any specific risk factors. They were only using shelters. Yes, we wanted to get rid of shelters, the shelter culture, but not of the buildings, which in most cases were located very centrally in the cities. 
And how was this made? How was it possible? The method was, you can call it carrot and stick. The carrot was the state housing fund grants for the renovation up to 50% of the total costs. The only condition was that after the renovation, the units should work as supported housing units according to housing first principles. The last big hostel we had in Helsinki was built in 1936. It had 250 bed places and it was run by Salvation Army. Now, after the re renovation, they have 81 individual flats and common facilities and on-site personnel for support. There has been a major structural change in homelessness services, especially in Helsinki. As you can see from this, this table, there is now only one service center for emergency use with 52 bed places. This picture shows the change in numbers, and it also shows the importance of social housing that has been provided by the municipal housing company of the city of Helsinki. One of the most important lessons I have learned from our program is that you can't have housing first without having housing first. So the, the role of affordable south, social housing is most crucial for, for a successful implementation of Housing First. Here is an example of, of a social, no, sorry, of social housing in Helsinki. You remember the photo I showed you quite, quite in the beginning of the big shelter Bat Cave. Well, later the musicians and their friends sold the radio station and with that money established a foundation to help fellow musicians in need. A few years ago they approached us because they had realized that a lot of musicians and other people in the music business had low incomes and needed affordable housing. Not everyone is a star like your Courtney Barnett. At least in Finland, most musicians have low and unsecure incomes. So together we built this house, which is quite a typical social housing building, except that part of the flats are reserved for low-income musicians, and there are also training facilities. And what's best for us, we now have a house band of our own. <laughs> Some words are needed of the Finnish social housing system. The Finnish affordable social housing <coughs> is around 13% of the total housing stock. It is mainly built and owned by municipal housing companies or non-profit NGOs like Y Foundation. <coughs> the system is called state-guaranteed rent-subsidized loans. When you want to build social housing, first you need to get a construction site land from city with a regulated price, which is below market prices. Either you buy it or, or the, or the city leases it. Then you present plans for, for the state on fund for housing development and finance. And when the plans are approved, the construction costs are determined, which sets the level of the affordable rent already in the beginning. You need to have 5% of your own money. The rest you can get as a cheap rent, mo cheap rent mortgage loan from banks for 40 years when you have the state guarantee. If the interest rate is over 2.5 at the moment, you can get state subsidy for it. The rent level is kept affordable as owner of the building can get only 4% return for its own investment in the rent. This is a very cheap system for the state. Last year we got around 6,500 new social housing dwellings and 8,500 new units were started and the state paid only 3.7 million euros as interest rate subsidies because the interest rate is so low at the moment. Rental contracts are normally permanent and you are eligible if you have low incomes and urgent housing needs. There is no absolute income ceiling and you don't have to move out if you get better incomes. 
Social housing has, has quality control, and in new housing areas, you can't tell the difference between free market rental buildings and social housing buildings. An important feature of this social housing is social mix, which means that in bigger cities, in each new housing area, you must have at least 20% social housing. For several years, this has been a very successful policy of to avoid social segregation. Actually, the economic recession in 2008 proved out to be a mixed blessing. In Finland, construction companies, Finland is a very small country, so the construction companies are not so keen on building social housing as it allows only a very limited possibility for, for profit, make, profit making. But when the, there is economic downturn and there isn't much demand on the free market, you can notice a very sudden increase in the social consciousness and you get a lot of, <laughs> lot of offers when you put out a tender. <laughs> the role of social housing is not safe even in Finland and you have to fight for it. Even in Finland, we have young market liberal economists who barely have lifted their nose from their theoretical textbooks and, and who claim <laughs> that we should stop the state support for social housing and just use the housing benefits so that everybody could choose where to live. Market will take care of affordable housing supply. You just have to look at UK or Ireland to see what happens when you let the markets rain. No way. At this moment, in Finland, we are using over 2 billion euros for housing benefits, general housing benefits, and over half of it goes to rents in, in the private market. So we really need more affordable social housing. But if there is one recommendation, if I would be asked to give to you, my personal opinion was, would simply be fix your social housing system. It's very organically tied to solving homelessness. Without it, the work to end the homelessness, unfortunately, some, sometimes reminds the ancient work of Sisyphus. It is time to return what we have achieved. In recent years, Finland has been the only European country, now also Norway, but you don't count them because they have the oil money. <laughs> where, where homelessness has decreased. In, in eight years, long-term homelessness has decreased by 35%. We have now a re record low homelessness with 6,615 single homeless persons and 214 families. Uh, the amount of homeless women has stayed on the same level and there are more homeless people with immigrant background, although in year, recent years also their share has diminished. But what's significant is that 84% uh, are living temporary with friends and relatives, so, so th we don't have rough sleeping as a phenomenon anymore. I can't guarantee that there are any rough sleepers in, in Finland, but uh, it's not something that we should have a special program because it's part of the Normal, normal work to deal with and provide s services for, for them if, if you meet any, any of them. But when you go around in Helsinki on the streets, you don't sleep, see people sleeping on the streets. There is growing concern for youth homelessness and also debts seem to be a more common cause of homelessness. On a more individual level, we have some follow-up data we are not very good in documenting what we do, but we have data that show that 82% of the tenants have succeeded in keeping their flat during two years. Of the 18% with whom we have failed and who have left their apartment unplanned, we have been collecting data. The main reasons have been uncommitment to support, lease debt, disturbance, and violent behavior. And I think that there are no simple magical solutions for these situations, but everything possible to avoid returning to homelessness has to be done. In many cases, it means moving to an environment where there is more support available, and there has to be always a possibility for a second chance or a third chance. Uh, it is also, I think, easy to help and feel empathy for nice homeless people, but homeless people are like uh, all other people. 
Not all homeless people are so nice, but they need help as well. You can't prioritize helping only nice homeless people. <laughs> There's one more important question that has been waiting to be answered. What about the costs? It is easy to dismiss money issues by saying that there are ethical and human rights justifications for helping homeless people. So we shouldn't bother ourselves with money, but we live in a world where money matters. Luckily, when you look at the costs, you find one more justification to end homelessness. It is even economically viable. I would say that we simply can't afford not to end homelessness. There has been several Source, financial sources for the pre program and these figures for, for the program period. So what have been the sources? Most of the money has gone for construction, constructing, building more affordable housing. But actually, the most crucial financing was not the big money for housing, but actually the 20 million euros for salary cost from the state for the salary cost of the support workers. This was a real incentive for cities, and it also made it possible to provide adequate support. And after the program period, actually, it has been solely on the city's responsibility for financing the, the support. With this financing, we got housing for around 3,500 homeless people, was it worth it? Certainly it was. We have some evaluation by Tampere Technical University which show that when long-term homeless person moves into permanent housing, into supported housing unit, the cost savings for, so for society are around 15,000 euros per one person per, per year. Savings come mainly from reduced use of special health care, emergency care, institutional care, but also from police and justice system. When people move into ind more independent housing, cost savings are even bigger, and also in the long run, they, they are expected to rise. Completely another thing is if uh, ex-homeless ex people manage to get back into employment and start paying taxes. As an investment, you can say that housing one homeless person into permanent housing pays itself back in seven years, and this when you either build or buy the housing. We, we now have a third national program running, which is concentrating on prevention. Preventing debts that leads into homelessness is now very much on the table. And one of the key measures for us has been the housing advisory work, which means mainly social workers actively contacting tenants in social housing residential areas, those tenants who are in the risk of rental areas. <coughs> there are now 80 housing advisors, and they have been able to, to prevent almost 3,000 evictions last year by making payment plans for, for, for debts and rental areas. Also, the role of people who have experienced homelessness has become more common in planning and the services and housing solutions. Last year, there were 50 experts by experience who took part in, in local projects. We have also had some small setbacks. This spring, we had a small group of experts appointed by our, our, by our prime minister to make proposals how we could stop the growing inequality in, uh, in Finnish society. I was in charge of housing and homelessness, and among other things, proposed that we should have zero tolerance to women's homelessness. To my surprise, I was informed informed by expert lawyers that it was against the Constitution as there are no grounds for positive discrimination. <laughs> Gender equality is a very serious matter for us. But actually, we already had started a project with several NGOs and three cities, so we renamed the project Gender Specific Work to End Homelessness. You can always beat lawyers guarding the Constitution by semantics. <laughs> Still, it's good to see that our government, no matter which the political coalition, which is now center right wing government, is in power, is determined to continue the work to end homelessness. Uh, this spring, our present government made a decision to aim to halve the existing homelessness before 
2022. I have to tell you, it was a very interesting process because the government was sitting, deciding about the financial framework for the next four years. And one of the assistants called me that said that there's an urgent need for something big and positive because the government is not very popular. They have made a lot of very controversial decisions concerning cutting some welfare benefits. So when this lady phoned me, I said, what about ending homelessness? So, but to make it more realistic, let's say that you have the existing homelessness in four years. And then she asked me how much money. And I said that to start, we need 20 million euros for support work. Well, she listened carefully, but when they made the decision, they put the 20 million in housing, so we still have to discuss about how you can move that money to support. Because the money is needed for support, not for more housing. Uh, this means that we are entering also a great, zo great zone because we have to find ways to tackle the issue of hidden homelessness. People living temporarily with friends, with friends and relatives. And in my opinion, this means, for example, that the share of social housing in new housing areas should be raised from 10 to 20 to 30 percent. So what's needed to end homelessness? First, the magic word, political will. But don't get allured by this, as in my opinion, there are two kinds of political will, action-oriented and media-inflated. For politicians who have a media-inflated political will, the most important thing is how things look in media, not what's actually happening. So look for those action-oriented ones. And if you want to get results, you have to be very pragmatic, very concrete. Concrete goals and measures, numbers, figures, they are important. Otherwise, you, you give the impression that even yourself, you are not believing in what you are aiming. You only say that we want to reduce homelessness. That's simply not enough. Think big and then make it big. I can understand that the philosophy of small steps, but really how long can the homeless people wait? for our endless pilots and experiments when we already know what works. It doesn't have to be a years long committee work to produce a plan. I'm sure that if we would pick up randomly 10 people from this room, you would produce a perfectly feasible plan to end homelessness in Australia. And yes, it is housing first, but not without social housing. Together they are a winning combination. And, and it is also an issue of social fairness to produce more s affordable social housing. No one wants to hear people whose only issue with ho housing is low incomes to say, should I start drinking to get a proper home? Last but not least is the question of culture. How we work together, how our good intentions materialize in the daily life of homeless people. A good friend and an excellent research on Nicholas Please is speaking here about different welfare regimes, but in my opinion, in my experience, there is also another dividing line between two cultures. And this is an absolutely unscientific analysis. But I recognize a culture of talking and a culture of doing. There are cultures, societies where you need to talk a lot and you need to involve all possible stakeholders. In these talks, which eventually, if you are lucky, will lead to decisions and legislations, which, which after more talk will lead to action plan, which after more talk will lead to something concrete. If you have managed to secure financing, which of course needs some more talk. You can get along with less talk, but it demands a lot, lot of trust in your partners. But I think that it's, it is an always important to keep, keep in mind two questions. What are the homeless people gaining from all this talk and doing at the end of the day, both literally and metaphorically speaking? And what is the time span? How long does it take to get something useful for homeless people done? Because I really don't know how much longer can the homeless people wait. The longer the time span becomes, the more urgent becomes the need for temporary solutions. 
which on the other hand prolong the time span to permanent solutions, and it, it's a vicious circle. The role of research in this context is, I think, interesting and important. I have nothing to say about the strict scientific procedures in conducting research on homelessness, but what puzzles me a little bit is the presenting and publishing of the research results. There are very traditional conventions and rules about scientific articles. So basically, it often seems to be directed to academic community. community. It means, once again, more talk. Of course, there are exceptions. Researchers who know how to present their findings for the general public or decision makers, but I think that they are as rare birds as classically trained singers performing decent crossover. As homelessness is a human rights, as a matter of fact, a question of life and death, it puts some extra ethical demands also on researchers. There is more urgent demand for the usability of, usability of research. So could there be a kind of housing first paradigm change in homelessness research publishing that's more inclined to doing culture? Could it be, for example, something like adding in the article after abstract main findings as tweets, like living in shelters can seriously damage your health? I don't know. Uh, I'm just wondering who are the professionals and decision makers who have time to read all the articles and reports that they should read. And I think that part of the success of Housing First is also that it can be described so concisely and in such a catchy phrase. Actually, all the latest interesting results that I have found, somebody has tweeted the link, so that this has been the way uh, how I have, I have follow, been following results. I think there are two essential ethical premises for homelessness policy. All action should aim to help as many as possible and as soon as possible. You know, when people get fed up with government or how things are in general, they go on the streets to demonstrate, or used to. Nowadays, they first go to social media and then on the streets. But the homeless people are there already. There is an ongoing demonstration against indifference and lack of compassion, which are the main reasons for homelessness. And I think it's our job, our moral obligation to get everybody in to end homelessness. Homeless people can't wait another 10 years. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yuha, for that, for that very enlightening uh, presentation. Don't go too far. <laughs> Look, we'll open, we'll open to questions from the floor in a moment, and we have a few coming through on the app already. Thank you for those. But perhaps let's, let's test the mood of the room with, with an app question. So, so grab your smartphones or your tablets, um, and we're going to cut to the fundamental question. To adequately address homelessness in Australia, do we need to go the way of Finland? A, yes, by tackling the housing market with significantly more social housing, and that's all that's required. Or B, yes with more social housing, but also with the right supports tailored to different groups, uh, like rough sleepers and, and young people. Or no, it's, it's about the right support for the right people at the right time. Let's start the countdown clock and uh, place your votes. Let's see if you've convinced them. Overwhelming support for support. <laughs> Fantastic. All right, look, we've got a couple of questions come through on the app already. We'll, we'll have microphones come to you. So if you have a question or a comment you'd like to, to ask directly, please raise your hand. We'll get a microphone to you as quickly as possible. In the meantime, a couple of questions have come through, particularly around um, what percentage of income um, is charged as rent uh, in the model in the properties. And then a follow-on question on have, have there been particular issues around maintenance of properties in terms of property damage by tenants and so on and what, and what your experience has been in that space? Well, I tried to explain but was not clear enough. So the tenants are supposed to pay full, full rent because it's real estate. 
there are real costs for the owner of the of the estate to keep it in good condition. But you can get a personal housing benefit to cover the cover the rent. So it's not uh, it's not based on your incomes, the rent. It's based on the actual cost of, of housing. But you can get personal support so that you have the money to pay the rent. The other one was property, maintenance. Property damage, yes. Well, it happens occasionally. Uh, we have this 6,000 uh, special scattered housing units for, for homeless people. And occasionally it happens that somebody is in the shower and, and sleeps there uh, with the water running, so there's a lot of water damage. But uh, some time ago there was an insurance company in Finland who introduced a new, new, new insurance for this kind of cases, so you can always take an insurance, so the extra maintenance costs are not, not a problem for, for this system, in this system. Terrific, terrific. Perhaps taking a, a slightly wider lens, the next question coming through on the app, how do we move politicians from a, a media-oriented or, or perhaps donor-oriented perspective to an action-oriented one? I mean, you, you talked about doing versus talking. Um, what's your experience there? I think that it's important that you are pragmatic and you have very concrete proposals. So instead of saying that uh, could you advocate to end homelessness? You, you have to say, we need uh, 6,000 flats and we need that amount of money. That's the language that politicians understand in, in their own work. And, and also you can, for our experience, it has been, maybe we had some lucky stars when we started the national program, but there are some politicians who realize that this is a very concrete thing. You can get concrete results. So the housing minister we had at that time was, a, as I said, a mod from moderate right-wing party. And he was very much on, on this matter and it was very good for his political career. After that, he was the vice president of the European Investment Bank and now he's the first politically elected mayor of Helsinki. So we are relying on his support to end homelessness in Helsinki in the, in the coming years.